All right, I am so excited that you are here with us for week three of this series that we are doing. Today is the day we get to talk about all this exciting stuff. We get to talk about the idea of a dragon coming, beasts coming, plagues, all this crazy stuff. It's gonna be really, really fun for sure as we go through it. I just wanna say this, okay? So today we are gonna read some things that are weird, okay? But if you have a relationship with Jesus, you do not need to be weirded out. We're going to read some things that are confusing, okay? But if you have a relationship with Jesus, you do not need to be confused. Today, we're going to read some stuff that it's downright scary, okay? But if you have a relationship with Jesus, you need not be scared today, okay? And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, we're going to sort that out before the end of the time we're here today as well. These are strange times we live in, okay? And luckily for our strange times, God ended up putting a strange book in his New Testament called the Revelation. It comes at the end of, of the New Testament. It's a prophetic vision that was given to the Apostle John when he was exiled to the island of Patmos at AD 90. And it not only dealt with what was going on in the churches then, but it was this prophetic vision of what was going to happen at the end times. And this book is often just thought of as like, man, it's, it's too strange to deal with. It's confusing. Using, it's scary, right? But I think that as times have gotten stranger, the book has actually started to make more sense. Not only that too, but I think that if we read it with the right lens, this book that most people say is scary can actually be comforting. This book that many say is confusing can actually be clarifying of the situation we're currently in. It's important that we read it with the right lens though. I said this in week one, uh, we need to read the book of Revelation like a dream. It's not a roadmap, it's not a linear story. It's like a dream where there's symbolism and there's all these details kind of piled on top of each other that ended up kind of coalescing to give us one picture. So we kind of read it in a dream-like thing where stuff changes and the timeline might not be perfectly linear as we go through it. In week one, we talked about the idea that the, the reference we see in Revelation is that Jesus has a plan for the end. And I think that is really, really good news for you and me. It's really good news as stuff gets crazy, as times get weird, that we realize that Jesus has a plan for the end. This isn't just devolving into chaos. He has a plan, which means that what's going on right here and now is in line with that plan. He understands it. He knows it. And we said that as we recognize Jesus has a plan, when we read Revelation, it's not that we fall in love with, it's not that we start trusting the plan, we trust Jesus. Jesus has a plan, we don't put our trust in the plan, we put our trust in Jesus. Now to get ready for those end times, week two we said that one of the things we can do to get ready isn't just trying to look for those, you know, like the signs, that would, some sort of revelatory signs, the end is coming. We talked about the idea that the most important step to get ready for the end isn't recognizing signs, it's repenting of our sins. It's turning from the things that we have in our life that are wrong. That in fact, when Jesus started this, the very first thing he did was he sent a bunch of letters to the church to say they needed to take care of their problems and get it straight. Because listen, there are people who understand the story of Revelation. They might understand the timeline, but they still might end up in eternal punishment in hell because they haven't put their trust in Jesus. They haven't repented of their sins. That's what we need to do to be ready for the end. Now, as we jump into this next section, where we talk about all this timeline of what's going to come and God's tribulation and judgment, I just want to give you a disclaimer, okay? The disclaimer is this. I'm going to give you the very best reading that I have of this, but there are people who have different opinions on this. In fact, there are people who love Jesus, who have different opinions on all these different things, and they all love Jesus. They all want the same thing, but they see it differently. If anyone ever tells you, oh, I know exactly what Revelation means. I know exactly what this means exactly what this means and they I know the exact timeline run okay because they're a liar they do not they are arrogant and proud we do our best guess on this based on what we read from the old testament and understanding it but of course there is some uncertainty inside of this as we read through it now there are five basic ways you can read revelation and I tell you this this is like you know, my side of stuff as someone who's trying to teach the Bible, understanding these, you don't need to remember these because it's not going to be on the final. Okay. No one's going to, no one's going to ask you this, but um, I want to give you what my perspective is. Okay. 
The first is the idealist reading. The idealist reading basically says that the book of Revelation is just like principles. It's just some sort of timeless spiritual story. It doesn't really have reference to certain dates or anything like that. And I think that that's a dismissive reading. I think that's the wrong way to read Revelation because there definitely does appear to be something to be said, like where there's real things that are really going to happen, not just spiritual principles that are there. The second is the preterist view. The preterist view says, oh, everything that's in Revelation, that happened back in John's time, right? John taught about this. It was about the Roman Empire, the time he sat in, uh, but it was there. And then we're just waiting for that very last few chapters where Jesus comes back. And I think that that's a shallow reading because I think that it's hard to contain all of that into what happened during John's time. I think there was reference to some of that, but that there's something greater than that. The third is the futurist perspective. The futurist perspective is that all of this is somewhere out in the future, that it's way ahead of us and all of it takes place in the future. But I think that this can be too comfortable of a reading because we could find ourselves up against the end. And if we do, we're going to start seeing those things happening here and now in our world. So it might not be in the future. The fourth is called the historicist perspective. And this is the idea that it started with John when he taught it. It started in that time frame and that we're actually living out the application of everything that's in Revelation all the way to the end, kind of we're in the story, okay? And the fifth is called the prophetess perspective. This follows the Old Testament pattern where prophets would give a prophecy and it would have one application for right then and there in that time frame. And then it would also have a bigger principle for like the end or something that was coming that was even bigger. And I think that that has some some definite uh, you know legs as well. That's a good way to le- to read it. In fact, what I do is I kind of blend those last two together. I think I'm kind of historicist and prophetess mixed together because I think there is kind of a then and a head. And then I also think that we could actually be inside of it. So that's where I come from as we go through this. So if you want to pick up your Bibles, you want to go to those sections uh, six through eleven. We're going to look through it together. But I just want to start by saying, as we read this, this story where we're going to see the timeline of God's tribulation, and then we're also going to see these prophetic visions, I think, which are giving us the idea of what we're supposed to do during this timeline, I think we can read it with two kind of wrong perspectives, okay? One, I think we can read it and say, oh, it's it's all just symbolic, And I think that's the wrong way to read it, to say like, oh, it's not like God's really going to send fire. It's not like God's really going to send that uh, that tribulation. It must mean some sort of symbolic gesture. And I think that's the wrong way to read it because there definitely does seem to be real things that are taking place. The other way that I think we can read it incorrectly is to read it too literal and not realize, of course, this is a prophetic vision where there's the idea that some of this is symbolism, the, the dates, the times might be something that references a symbolic thing and not an exact thing as we read through it. In fact, I like what Peter says in 2 Peter uh, 3, 3 through 10. He kind of wrote about what's going to happen in the end times when people start talking about this. And I think he kind of deals with both of these subjects as he's writing to the church. He says this, Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They'll say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. He says, there's going to be people who are just like, oh, they've been saying Jesus is coming back forever. It's never happened. I, it must just be something symbolic, right? Because like we've been waiting around and, it, and it's not taking place. He says this, verse 5, They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out of the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, 
And the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. I like this because he kind of addresses both. He says, there's going to be people who are like scoffing, saying like, yeah, they've been saying Jesus is coming back forever. And he says, don't be those people who think this is just some sort of symbolic story. But also, I like what he says. He says, remember though, you know, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day to God. He doesn't exist in our time frame, this perfect little linear second by second, hour by hour. He exists outside of time. And I think that's a good reference too when people get too literal about this, being like, well, it said seven years and it said three and a half days. And it's like, well, right, but God might be using those as symbols of the fullness of the time that he has, has, he's laid out for these things, right? I actually think as we read this story, as we go through here, it's not going to be a perfect linear timeline because it is a prophetic vision. So as we look at the next few chapters, here's what we see. We see this timeline of God's tribulation, and it's three sets of seven tribulations that are brought to the earth. There's seven seals, there's seven trumpets, there's seven bulls. Three sets of seven that come through. And some people will just read these perfectly saying, oh, see, the next one happened, the next one happens, the next one's. But it seems as though some of these might overlap because, in fact, basically the seventh of each of these kind of references the same basic end. So it's possible they're interwoven or they're overlapped. Not only that, but then there's three separate prophetic visions that John gets during these. And some people think they happen when they come in the timeline, but they actually happen as basically like between the sixth and seventh of each one. And I think instead, these are prophetic asides that go along with the storyline. And I think these prophetic visions kind of tell us how we should live, how we should be reacting during this tribulation time. So what I want to start by is just going through the timeline of this tribulation and then we'll jump back and handle those three separate visions, okay? Here's what it says. First, there are seven seals, and these seven seals are opened by the Lamb of God. That's Jesus. And as he begins to crack these seals, the beginning tribulations come. Now, the first four seals that are opened are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You might reference that because that's been used a lot in our culture. The first seal is broken and a white horse comes out and peace spreads throughout the land. The second seal is broken and a red horse comes out and war comes across the land. The third, a third a seal is broken and a black horse comes out and famine comes across the land where people can't afford to buy food. The fourth brings a pale, greenish, zombie-like horse. And that represents death, disease, pestilence. Tons of people die. In fact, it says that the rider of this horse is death and Hades, that there's two riders. Death, of course, represents the death of our bodies. Hades represents the death of our soul. The fifth seal is broken and the souls of those who have been murdered for their faith in heaven call out to God. They're beneath his, his throne and they call out and say, when will there be justice for what was done to all of us who are believers? And God says, wait just a little longer. There are a few more who are to die for their faith and then I will bring justice. The sixth seal is broken and the sun and the moon and the stars are struck. The earth basically begins to fall apart. Islands and mountains are ruined. This seems to be like the beginning of the destruction of earth. And then the seventh seal is broken and silence breaks out in heaven for half an hour as a bowl of fire is thrown down to the earth. Now in that moment, seven trumpets are brought out. And we begin this next series of these judgments on earth. And I'll just admit, this stuff kind of gets a little bit scary, okay? Okay, but stick with me. I know it gets a little bit scary, but we'll get to it. And I'll show you what we can do inside of it. Don't get freaked out. Don't turn away. Don't turn this off, okay? The first trumpet blows. And it says that earth is scorched by hail and blood. Now, when we see like blood in this, I don't think it means actually blood. I think it means like death, basically destruction. It's symbolic in nature. But this hail comes and it says it destroys tons of the land. In fact, it says about a third of the land. Now, it might actually mean a third. It might mean a portion of land that gets destroyed. The second trumpet blows and the ocean is partly destroyed by a flaming mountain that falls into the ocean. Says so again, a third of the ocean is destroyed, blood, all these things. The third trumpet's blown and the waters are hit. So this is like springs and rivers are hit by this star that falls from heaven called Wormwood. And basically it says they turn to blood. Again, I don't think they're actually turned to blood. I think they're poisoned and they cause death. The fourth trumpet is blown and the sun and the moon and the stars are partly darkened. A third of them disappear. Some believe that actually some of the stars will fall from the sky, that something will happen with the sun and the moon. Some believe this is actually a judgment of time changing, that basically two-thirds where there was three-thirds before, that time speeds up in some sense. 
The, the uh, sixth trumpet, or excuse me, the fifth trumpet blows and smoke rises from a pit. This, this star, this demon comes down, smoke rises from a pit and kind of encapsulates this area. And then these evil locusts, these demon locusts show up. And these locusts aren't like normal locusts. It says they basically have like these metal breastplates over them and they bite and sting people for the period of five months. That There's this kind of just this wave of these locusts hurting people and attacking people. Then there's this giant war with the sixth trumpet that's blown. A massive world war, gigantic war, unlike anything we've ever seen. And basically it says there's these demonic horses that spit fire and brimstone from their mouths. There's kind of this terrifying picture. And tons and tons of people die in this war. The seventh trumpet blows and the temple of God is opened. We see that the, uh, the actual like Ark of the Covenant is there. And it seems as though as lightning and thunder kind of quake across the world as though the end has come. Now, people will say these are all these prophetic things that are going to come ahead of time. That basically this is the judgment of God that will come as these trumpets are blown in our world. But some people with the historicist perspective actually believe that some of these trumpets have already happened because there's actually kind of two forms of God's judgment. There's his active judgment where he brings things into our life, but then there's also God's passive judgment where he kind of takes his hand of blessing away from us and he lets us destroy things in our life. They believe that some of these trumpets have already happened because God has done his passive judgment and we've begun to basically destroy ourselves and create these trumpets. In fact, here's what some people believe. And I'll just give these to you. It's kind of freaky. Okay. I'll just freak you out and then we'll go along with the timeline. I'm not saying this is for sure true. I'm just saying it is interesting to think about for sure. Some people believe that the first trumpet where the earth was scorched by hail is represented by World War One. In World War One, the earth was absolutely destroyed destroyed over in that section by massive amounts of shelling. Millions of shells were shot. Entire landscapes were changed because of how many explosives were used. Number two, where the ocean is partly destroyed, they believe this is a depiction of World War II. It says in the, seventh, in the second seal that a flaming mountain from heaven comes and destroys part of the oceans. And they believe that flaming mountain is actually the atomic bomb that was dropped by the United States of America to end World War II. On top of that, there was so much sea battle at the time in World War II with U-boats and with battleships that they believe around a third of the boats on the water during World War II were sunk as is referenced in that. The third trumpet, the idea of the waters being uh, turned to blood by a star called Wormwood. Strangely enough, the word Wormwood in Russian is Chernobyl. For real, that's the same, same word. Their word for Wormwood is Chernobyl. And they actually believe that this third trumpet where the waters are poisoned was the meltdown of Chernobyl, which released massive amounts of nuclear waste into the atmosphere that poisoned waterways. And not only that, but right now, as it's been shut down, they believe that actually it could be poisoning aquifers below it, which could be causing cancer and death throughout all of these years. The fourth, where the sun and moon and stars are partially darkened, they believe was a change that maybe we didn't actually notice, but it was a speeding up of time. They believe this is kind of like the industrial or technology revolution because basically it says that a third of it is pulled away, basically meaning that what used to take three measures only takes two measures now, that we're going faster than ever, that everything in the world is speeding up, which kind of does feel that way because of our, our technology and our industry and everything like that. The fifth seal, which is the smoke from the pit, they actually believe is the Persian Gulf War in which Saddam set on fire over 700 oil wells that created plumes of smoke so big that it actually blocked out the sun for days at a time. And in fact, out of the smoke, they say there come these demon locusts. Historicists believe that what John was seeing was modern day attack helicopters. And it was just a man from AD 90 trying to describe what he was seeing. If you read the, the description, it's kind of interesting. Think about an attack helicopter today, he says basically that these locusts had crowns on their heads, human faces, hair like women, teeth like lions, and their wings roared like the army of chariots, and that they attacked people, right? You go, wow, that's kind of a weird, freaky parallel where you think that does kind of sound like how you would describe it if you've never seen one before and you didn't even know that technology existed. 
And then most historicists believe that then, if that's the case, we sit right before the sixth trumpet, the gigantic world war. Most people believe that World War III is the depiction of this, a mega war across the globe that would come somewhere out of the east, be it China, be it Russia, something like that, that would start this massive war. And that when, he, again, John describes these demonic the horses that basically are blowing fire. He's just describing modern tanks or maybe even future weapons that are even more crazy than today because he says these horses shoot fire, smoke, and sulfur from their mouths. Their tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people, perhaps some sort of future weapon. Now, okay, I know you're like, wait, what? Like that freaks me out. You mean we could actually be in this? Possibly, yeah, possibly. And I don't think that takes away with where we're going because I think the application of this, if that is the case and it is the situation where we're actually multiple trumpets into this, I think it's going to apply the same way as if it is still just getting ready to happen. Now, last, there are seven bulls. And these seem to be God's active judgment on the world, the final thing that he brings to it, because it really, really coincides with the end, with the complete destruction of the world. The first bowl is poured out and sores kind of break out on people in the world. Painful sores, specifically everyone with the mark of the beast, which we'll talk about in just a minute. The second bowl is poured out and the oceans are completely destroyed. It says they turn to blood and all of the wildlife in the oceans are killed. The third bowl is pulled out poured out and water basically turns to blood. So rivers, lakes, uh, springs, they all become poisonous or they all turn to something that is undrinkable. The fourth bowl is poured out and the, sky, the sun begins to be so bright and so hot that it begins to scorch people. Perhaps the ozone layer melting away or something like that where the sun begins to burn people. The fifth, the fifth bowl is poured out and darkness, a specific like dark spiritual darkness, falls over the evil leader of these wars in a specific area. The sixth bowl is poured out and this gigantic war kicks off. In fact, it says it's supposed to happen right by the Euphrates River that dries up to have all this happen. And this is what we know as Armageddon. Interestingly, most of us think Armageddon just means like the end of the world. Armageddon is actually a real place. It means the plain of Megiddo. It's a real place in this area that is a gigantic stretch of land. In fact, Napoleon, when he saw this, when he was conquering that area, said that is the best battlefield ever created in the world. And they believe this is where this giant war will take place. And then the seventh bowl is poured out and it says it's poured into the air and basically it brings fire and it brings lightning and destruction and hate hail and mountains and, and oceans and islands are all just completely destroyed. This is the end. This is the burn down of the planet to destruction that God brings. Now, stop for a second. First of all, you don't got to remember all that. Don't worry. We'll get to the application of it, okay? But I just want to make sure we understand this will happen. This will happen. This is God's promise that the fact that he is actually going to bring this world to a close. He will destroy this planet and then he will make it anew, which we will talk about more next week. I need you to get this because I need you to understand it gets worse before it gets better. That if we go into the end times, it's going to get worse. Things are going to get hard. Things are going to get difficult. Bad things are going to happen, which are going to take us to the end of this world. And you need to know that for sure. Now, during this timeline, okay, there's these three separate asides where John sees some of this, then he turns and he sees a prophetic vision. He sees some of this, he turns and sees a prophetic vision. And I think each of these are important for us to understand because they teach us how we should live during this end time world, okay? Here's the first one. He looks and there's a situation of the 144,000. It's in Revelation 7, okay? Before the trumpets are blown. It says this in Revelation 7, 2 through 4. It says, And I saw another angel coming up from the east, carrying the seal of the living God. And he shouted to those four angels who had been given power to harm land and sea, Wait, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. It says that basically 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes are marked. Now, some people believe that what this is is literally 144,000 Jewish people who are going to be prophets in the end times. Uh, some have actually taken this to say, oh, there's only 144,000 people in heaven, which doesn't make any sense. But here's what I think, actually. 
When we look at week one, we talked about how John heard the angel say, the lion of Judah is going to take and come and take this scroll. But then it says he turns and he looks and he sees the slain lamb. There's a differentiation between what he hears and what he sees. He hears kind of the prophecy and he sees the reality. And this is the same with this. He hears 12,000 from each tribe, 144,000. But in the very next section, right after this, he turns and what he sees is something different. Here's what it says in Revelation 7, 9 through 10. It says, After this I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and had palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. It's interesting because basically one of the angels says to John, like, hey, who are these people? And John basically says, like, I, you work here, bro. I'm just visiting. Like, you tell me, right? Which, again, just makes me think, like, this is actually, it really happened to John, and he really wrote it down because that's such a weird comment. But he's like, who, who are these people? He's like, I don't know, but you do. And he's like, yeah, you're right. These are all the people who die in the tribulation. These are the people who end up staying close to God during the tribulation. And here's what I think. I think what he was hearing and seeing was the same thing. I think he heard hundred. 44,000. He saw the multitude of the tribes because I actually think this is a symbolic representation of God's people. People thought that it was just going to be this Jewish faith and that God said, I'll take 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Remember, 12 is the number of kind of like human fullness. There's the 12 tribes and he's going to take 12,000 kind of representing everybody that he's ever going to take. But he looks and it's all tribes, it's all people, way more than 144,000. I think that 144,000 is a symbolic picture of all of the people whom God is going to mark, whom he is going to seal. Not just Jewish people, but all of us who trust in Jesus are then going to be sealed and protected during this time. In fact, this makes perfect sense with what we read when Paul talks to the Ephesian church. Ephesians 1, 12-14. He says this, God's purpose was that we Jews were the first to trust in Christ and that we would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. Now, interestingly, he identified you. That word identified in the original translation is sphagizo. Sphagizo means he sealed you. What the picture is, is it's like a king. Kings would have a signet ring. They would have a seal that they would put on things, like a wax seal, and they would press that symbol into it. And it would mean that it is mine. No one else can touch this, right? That this belongs to me, that by my authority this is given to it. And he says, you're sealed when you give your life to Jesus. He gives you the Holy Spirit, and that's the promise that happens. In fact, he just continues. He says, basically, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he has promised and that he has purchased just us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. I believe this is a massive encouragement. During the time where this destruction begins, in the middle of it, he sees this prophetic vision. And what God says is, I'm going to show up and I'm going to seal people with my identity. And listen to me, here's what's so cool. Throughout the rest of Revelation, we see these 144,000 with Jesus a number of other times. And every single time it is 144,000 that doesn't come back and it's 143,999 or something like that. Not a single one is lost. Friends, I I believe that if we trust in Jesus, God is going to seal us. If we find ourselves in these end time days, he is going to seal us and he is going to keep us through any of these things and we will not be pulled from his hands because we are marked and we belong to him and not to the world. Now, that's the first, the first vision. It goes back to the tribulation, turns, and a second vision shows up. This one is of an angel. Angel comes down from heaven. He's standing there and he has kind of this little book and he kind of yells out and an interesting thing happens in Revelation 10, 3 through 4. It says, He gave a great shout like the roar of a lion and when he shouted, the seven thunders answered him. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, keep secret what the seven thunders said and do not write it down. Again, side note for you, for anybody who says like, I know exactly what's going to happen with Revelation. Just be like, bro, you don't even know what the seven thunders are, right? And if they're like, what? Be like, exactly. God did not give us all the details. He actually had this situation where he could have written down seven more between these different sevens that happened. But he said, you know what? Don't write that down. Again, just reminding us, it's not about us perfectly understanding this because God said they don't need to know what the seven thunders are. 
But then he goes to this angel, and the angel has this little book. And he says, basically, John, you're going to eat this, and it's going to be sweet in your mouth, sour in your stomach, and then you're going to go and you're going to prophesy. And you think, that's weird, right? Why would he eat a book? But it's actually an interesting symbolic picture that we see over and over again with prophets in the Old Testament, in which they were kind of given something to either eat or like one had like a coal touched to his mouth. It's about preparing them, like saying, God's going to give you what you need, then you are going to go and prophesy. I think what he was saying to John, maybe it was this book or the rest of his life, that you're going to prophesy what God's given you, you're going to give to the world and try to steer people to Jesus. Now, right after that, he turns and looks, and this is during the sixth trumpet. This is when this great war is happening on earth, this terrible thing that's taking place. And during it, there's another prophetic vision. He sees two witnesses show up from God. And it says they show up for three and a half years, which might be three and a half years, might be the broken seven, which is kind of a shortened period of time that God has decided. And they come with power and they come doing miracles. They can pray and the heavens can be sealed up where there's no rain. They can call down fire. In fact, it says that when some try to attack them, they can basically take and spit fire from their mouths and it melts them down. Which I don't know if that's symbolic. I hope it's not because I think that's like the coolest thing ever. It's such an awesome power that they would have. But they come in this amazing power and they're telling people about who God God is during this great war and time of tribulation that they should turn their eyes to Jesus and then all of a sudden the beast the one who's running this war turns on them and he kills them here's what it says in Revelation 11 7 through 12 when they complete their testimony the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them and he will conquer them and he will kill them and their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem the city that is figuratively, figuratively called Sodom and Egypt the city where the Lord was crucified and for three and a half days all the people's tribes languages and nations will stare at their bodies no one will be allowed to bury them all the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of these two prophets who have tormented them but after three and a half days, God's, God breathed life into them and they stood up. Terror struck all who were staring at them. And then a loud voice from heaven called the two prophets, come up here. And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. Whoa, I guess a crazy story. That God's going to send these two prophets. They're going to do amazing miracles. Then the, the enemy of God will take and he will kill them. He'll leave them in the street. Everyone will see that they're dead. And three and a half days later, they will resurrect, proving God's power inside of it. Here's what I think we can take away from this. During this tribulation time, John has given this book and said, go and prophesy. During the worst time of the war, the scariest time that's going to happen during the tribulation, God sends these special prophets to come with power and even does a miracle that seems impossible to negate that they come back from the dead and they rise to the clouds. Here's what we can take from this. And again, it is another great, great comfort. Listen to me. God will continually call his people even until the last days. God will send prophets. He will send words. He will do amazing miracles to get people's attention right up through the last days to try to rescue them. God is not interested in veiling this and in trying to keep this secret. God isn't trying to trick people into going to hell because they don't recognize what's going on. The voices will be louder than ever. As the tribulation ratchets up, there will be louder voices than ever with even greater miracles to point people's attention to God. Just like Peter said in that verse we read at the beginning, it's not God's intention for any to be destroyed, but he wants all to be saved. And listen, there will be voices, great voices steering people to Jesus all the way through. There's a third vision. He goes back and he turns one more time and a third vision comes to him. And this one definitely happens outside of the normal timeline. It can't happen where it does inside of the line of tribulation. This is kind of the overarching picture of what happens in the world leading up to this tribulation that happens in the, on the earth. In fact, it kind of goes back to all the way to the beginning. This is Revelation 12. The vision sees a woman who's getting ready to give birth. And then there's this dragon that is kind of waiting in order to snatch up the baby as soon as she has it. People are like, that's a weird picture. 
But what it is, is it's the nation of Israel getting ready to have Jesus, their son. Because this child has said that they will rule the nations with an iron rod. And that's that picture of Jesus. And the, the dragon is the devil that he's waiting to destroy and to kill Jesus because he knows the power he has. I mean, literally, Satan actually did this. When Jesus was born, we can read about it in the Gospels that at the time, he convinced the rulers at the time to murder all of the children in an area, hoping to kill Jesus while he was still an infant. This is a real application of this. But God rescues the child and takes it to heaven right away. The dragon does not get it. So the dragon goes and starts a war with God. He starts a war with God. In fact, it says that he knocks a third of the stars from the heavens. And people believe that that represents the angels. And at the very beginning, remember that actually Jesus said the stars represent the angels of the churches. And that basically Satan convinced a third of the angels to turn and rebel against God, which is really, really sad. But at the same time, I always take that as positive news. It means there's two thirds on our side and one third on his, which means we got the winning team for sure. But he starts a war in heaven and it says that he and the, the angels, the angels that rebel, they're all thrown out of heaven. Basically, they lose the war in heaven. That doesn't work. They can't overthrow God in heaven and they are brought to earth instead. And here the dragon decides he is going to set up his own kingdom here on this earth. Everything that God creates Satan counterfeits. And he can't take and overtake the, the, the kingdom that he has in heaven. So he tries to make a counterfeit kingdom here on this earth. The dragon, the devil, decides that what he needs is he needs a Jesus, right? He needs a Jesus just like God has a Jesus. So what he does is he gives his power to a beast that's called the beast that rises out of the water. The water basically represents the mass of people, the Gentile people at large. And this is what we would know as the Antichrist. They describe him in symbolic terms, seven heads, 10 crowns. It's not like that. He's not some sort of monster. It's going to be a human being who's a charismatic, interesting leader, a political leader, likely. It says this in Revelation 17, 9 through 13. This calls for a mind with understanding. The seven heads of this beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. Five kings have already fallen. The sixth reigns now and the seventh is yet to come. But his reign will be brief. The scarlet beast that was but is no longer is that eighth king, saying the eighth king is going to be the Antichrist. He is like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. The ten horns on the beast are ten kings who have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast, and they will all agree to give him their power and authority. Now, what most people believe is that these kingdoms, these seven kingdoms, represent the seven great kingdoms on earth so far. People who believe kind of the historicist perspective say this makes sense because if you go through, one, the first kingdom would be Egypt, two would be Assyria, three would be Babylonia, four would be Medo-Persian Empire, the five would be the Greek Empire, and the sixth, which he says is reigning currently, would be the Roman Empire, who were in charge when John was writing this. He says then a seventh will come to power for a short period of time, and then after that seventh, the eighth, will be the Antichrist who will take over the world. Some people believe the seventh great kingdom is Western democracy. Basically, after the Roman you know, Empire and all that fell, that the next great world-dominating empire was Western democracy. And that perhaps this is the seventh kingdom, and after this comes the eighth, which is he. They also believe that the ten horns represents a world government, a globalization in which ten leaders are basically elected to oversee the entire globe, the entire world power. But then what happens is they decide that this Antichrist, he should be in charge, and they abdicate their power and give it all. They elect. We elect them. They elect this one person to lead, perhaps because he's, he's some sort of symbolic figure or people believe he's kind of God here on earth. Again, if you want to see this, this is crazy. You can go all the way back to to Daniel 7, and you can read this same prophecy. God gave it to Daniel 700 years earlier. How amazing is that? This prophecy has been around for that long. So he, he makes his, his antichrist, and then the devil also makes his counterfeit Holy Spirit. He ends up bringing the beast out of the earth, and this is basically a prophet that speaks for the other beast, for the antichrist. He kind of points everyone's attention at him. Most people believe the antichrist will be a political leader. This prophet will be a spiritual leader, and basically the spiritual leader will come up and take the place of the Holy Spirit 
Spirit that points to Jesus, only he's the evil Holy Spirit who will point to the Antichrist and say, why would we follow that old Jesus? Why would we follow that old one? There's one here and now who is much greater. Look, there is your God and that he's going to point the nations and point religious worship to this Antichrist. Notice this. This is, this is what Satan always does. He counterfeits what God creates. He basically creates his own little evil triune God, his own little trinity here on this earth to rule his own little kingdom. Now, this evil counterfeit uh, Holy Spirit, who is known as kind of the beast out of the earth, the prophet, he says this in Revelation 13, 14 through 18, um, or it says about him. It says, with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered that the people make a great statue of that first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. There's apparently some sort of thing that's going to happen where the Antichrist is wounded and comes back to life. Maybe some sort of miraculous thing that makes people think he really is something beyond this world. He says that he was then permitted to give life to the statue so that it could speak. That's weird, right? And then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to get a mark basically on their right hand or on their forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast. For the number is the number of man. His number is 666. So the Antichrist will be, you know, fatally wounded and then come back. It'll kind of be miraculous and prove to people, oh, he must be something amazing. Then a statue of the beast is erected and it begins to have life, basically. It begins to talk and make commands. And then everyone is told they have to get the mark of the beast on their hands or their forehead to be part of commerce and to exist. Now, the mark of the beast... There's been so much discussion on that over the years. So much conversation of what is the mark of the beast? What does it really mean? The whole idea of calculating 666. 666 is still to this day. I mean, people really know that number. In fact, it's interesting. If you, if you look, when people buy properties that are actually addressed as 666, they petition to change them to 668 or 664. Buildings that will build like a tall sky rise or they, a high rise where they have over six stories. If they have a six story and they have more than 66, Six rooms on that, they will not label one of them 666. They'll actually skip it and go 665 to 667 because no one wants to buy that spot. No one wants to rent that spot because of what that number represents. And people have tried to calculate this because the original language this was written in both the Greek and actually the Hebrew of the Old Testament that the letters actually have numerical value as well. So they say, so you can actually calculate the name. And the preterist people did this. They said, if you take 666, one one of the names that add up to 666 is Nero Caesar. And what he was just saying is Nero Caesar, the guy who's in charge of the Romans right now, man, he's the Antichrist. He's the one that we should worry. Other people, of course, have said, well, wait a second. There's, this must have a future picture. We need to calculate the number of this and People during the Reformation, they ended up saying that they thought that the Pope was actually the representative of the Antichrist because the Pope's actual title inside the church is Vicarious Philly Day, which equals up to 666. Many others will say that 666 just simply represents the number of man. That six is the number of man. 666 would be the fullness of man. But there's also kind of a wrench in the plan because the most ancient text we have of Revelation, if you read Revelation, you'll always see an asterisk by 666 because the actual the most ancient text we can find of Revelation don't list the number as 666. It lists it at 616. So actually, perhaps it's a different number altogether. All this being said, okay, I don't think the idea was for people to be able to walk around trying to find who's named a, a name that adds up to 666 or 616. Like, keep track. And like, what's your name? Like, Bob Thomas. Like, that adds up to 666. Get him, right? I don't think that was actually the idea. I think that the Jewish readers who heard this right away, they understand the picture that John was giving for sure. It had application right then and there, and they recognize it as an anti-Shema. The Shema is a prayer they would say every single day. And the first prayer of the Shema is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8. Here's what it says. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. 
You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them on your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. That the beast is counterfeiting the Shema that was supposed to remind them. And that a lot of people right away say the reason why you tied something on your hands and put something on your head was to remind you that your actions you did and that your thoughts should be focused on God as your one true God. And they would say this, this demon beast is calling us to take and make our thoughts and make our actions about him instead. Now here's what I, I need you to get from all of this. Okay, When I read this story of the dragon and the beast and this counterfeit prophet and all of this, okay? Here's what I take. It's really, really deep, okay? You ready for it? This is really, really deep. The end could come quickly. <laughs> it's not that deep, is it? The end could come quickly. When I read this, I go, there doesn't seem to be like a lot that would stand in the way of this, right? Like, I could see this happening really soon. In fact, it's interesting, when we read this, there are things that for the last few thousand years, people read and thought, I can't see how that could happen and those have disappeared in our current situation. For instance, for a long time when the prophets were killed and it said that all nations would see these dead people lying in the streets for three, day, three days and then see their resurrection, people said, how in the world would everyone in the world see these guys laying dead in the street? Well, now you're like, um, they'd post it to Facebook, right? And it would be on the news and it would be everywhere and everyone would see it. In fact, I mean, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there are literally areas in Africa right now, like remote areas that don't have clean drinking water, but they do have good cell service and people have smartphones. For real, that's a real thing. That smartphones are so prevalent, the internet is so expansive that they believe really soon the internet will be everywhere. People, companies are trying to get it everywhere they can. Smartphones are just, I mean, there's, there's more smartphones than there are people on the planet Earth right now. It's insane to think about. That everyone could see this. And you think, wow, that's amazing. The false prophet making this the statue of the beast, and then giving life to it, people think, oh, some sort of weird black magic. For us nowadays, we're like, it's a robot with artificial intelligence. Like, that's, that's going to happen. Like, I saw it in Terminator. I knew this was going to happen. Skynet's going to take over. He makes the statue. The statue starts saying, kill all humans who don't bow to me, right? It's like, of course that's going to happen. They say that they're basically going to put a mark on everyone's hand around their head and they won't be able to trade, they won't be able to buy, they won't be able to sell if they don't have it. And people would think, wow, that's a massive you know, thing to try to implement. And how would you do that across the entire globe? And now, for us, we're like, well, that makes sense, right? You literally have microchips they could put in your hand or in your head that would register everything. And not only that, but everyone's talking about getting away from real currency and going to digital currency. And there's online currencies that don't even have anything to do with where you live at in the globe. That There could be a one world digital currency easily where it would just be all run through electronically. And you could just, if you don't have the mark, you don't have the chip, you don't get to buy something. You don't get to do, you don't go to get a, go, go to the doctor and get health care. Or you don't have any money because it's all in the air. It's all this digital currency. We think, wow, that could happen. The idea that there could be one world government, people forever thought, how could you create a government that could manage the entire world? It would be impossible. But now with all of our technology and information, you think, well, easily you could. With all of the communication, you could have one elected group. of. In fact, I mean, we have the United Nations now. It wouldn't take that big of a step to basically say we're going to put one group of people in charge who then could give the power over to the Antichrist. I say all this just to say, when I look at this, I go, Wow, the end could come quickly. I mean, it could happen. I don't see a lot standing in the way, right? When Jesus was asked this question about what's going to happen, he said, oh, there'll be wars, there'll be all this. That's not it. But he says, I'll tell you what will happen. Christians will begin to be persecuted. The church will have a massive falling away. Interesting to think about what's happened this year with how few people are coming back to churches. Not only that, but he says basically the gospel will be preached to the entire world and then the end will come. And listen to me, I was just at a conference this year where the Bible Society is creating solar powered MP3 players and getting them into remote villages that have not been reached by the gospel, having elders inside of it read the story of Jesus in their local language, reproducing them and sending them out into these areas. And they wholeheartedly believe before the end of your and my life, Lifetime, the gospel will reach every corner of this globe. That that's really going to happen in our lifetime, most likely, because of how amazing our technology is. The gospel will go everywhere in this world. Jesus says, then it's the end. Now, what do we do with that? 
What do we do with Jesus' words? And what do we do with these stories of Revelation where we look at them and we think, well, this, could, this could happen. I could see that happening soon. Or we look and we think, maybe those trumpets really have already sounded. Maybe we are getting ready for this. What do we do? Well, I need us to understand this because some could take this and they could be like, okay, so we need to make a plan, right? We need to get the guns and we need to get the water. And we need to head for the hills and we need to make this plan. But listen to me. The goal of Revelation is not for us to stay alive. That's not the goal. It's not for us to stay alive. It's for us to stay focused. It's not for us to stay alive. I mean, that's never been the call of Christians ever. Jesus never came. God never spoke to people and said, what I need you to do is to stay alive. It's like throughout history, Jesus has told Christians like, you're going to go and you're going to proclaim the gospel. You leave your life here and now in this world. You put your eyes on the future life that I have for you. And many of you are going to die. Many of you are going to be persecuted. Many of you are going to be, you know, your, your life here is going to be cut short, but then you're going to step into eternity. The purpose of Revelation, seeing all these things, isn't so we can like make a plan to stay alive. That's not it at all. It's so that we can stay focused. In fact, when Jesus told his disciples about the fact that the end could be coming soon, they said, what should we do, basically? And he says, stay alert. Stay awake. If the master gave somebody, you know, put him in charge of something, he said, the worst thing you could do is think, well, the master's not coming back for a while. I can do whatever I want. He says, you need to stay focused. Focus means we get rid of some of the extra stuff and we put our attention on what really matters. Listen to me. Jesus' death on the cross, it paid for our sins and it created a way where we're going to step from this life into eternity. And we need to take our eyes just solely off of this world and put it in that perspective. And when we do, we realize the fact that if we start seeing these signs, they shouldn't bring fear. They should bring courage. It shouldn't make us be like, we need to figure out how we stay alive. We should start getting focused on what we need to do to get ready. Because listen to me, even if we have a plan, what are you going to go stay alive for? Like even, uh, we're going to make a plan. We're going to dis For what? It's the end. It's not like some natural disaster you're going to ride out and then continue on in your life. It's over then. If you see this stuff, it's like, let's make a plan. It's like, well, cool. So either you die today or you die in just a few more days or weeks or months or whatever. It's the end, bro. It's happening. So why would we do that? Instead of focusing on just maintaining a few more days or a few more months of our life, why wouldn't we focus on what really matters, which of course is moving forward, the gospel. The goal of Revelation is not for us to stay alive, but to stay focused. I think the reason why God gave us all these pictures in Revelation is so that when they start to happen, we wouldn't lose faith. Because if he never said anything about all this, think about what we just read, and then we started to see that happening in our world, I think a lot of us could start to lose our faith and be concerned, be like, is everything falling apart? Is this God's plan? You know, I thought Jesus said he was coming back. And, and it could start to get really scary where we could start to have this fear inside of us. But instead, he told us these things were coming. So listen, when they do come, and when these tribulations start to show up, and when these political things start to happen, and the world starts to freak out and say, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening. The church is in this amazing place where when everyone else is freaking out and confused, we are standing there going, we know exactly what's going to happen. He already wrote it. I know exactly what's going to happen next. He already foretold it. When everyone's freaking out looking for answers, Christians are actually going to be in this spot where as, as, as stuff gets crazier, they get calmer because they're like, we knew this was coming. This is proof that what God said he was going to do is happening. This is proof that God really is real. It's happening. Just like he said it, that faith is going to increase in the church during this time. Friends, the end could come quickly. So what do we do? Well, like what Peter says in that same verse that we started with. The very next section, I kind of split it so I could, I could show you what his response to all this was. He says, the end really is coming, right? Don't scoff at it. It's coming soon. He says this in 2 Peter 3, 11 through 15. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth that he has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. 
This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He said, it's going to happen. God will melt down the very elements in judgmental fire. And he said, what should be our response? He said, it shouldn't be fear. He said, but I'll tell you what we should do. We should get living. Living peaceful lives that are focused on being pure and blameless. And he said, second, you know, the whole reason why God's waiting a little longer is so more people can come and give their hearts and give their souls to him. So what does that mean for us? It means get to work. Get to work. Begin to spread the gospel. The reason why there's this little bit of an extension until it happens is so that more could know. And that's on us to share the gospel, to spread the good news so that more might make it to heaven and understand. The goal of Revelation is not for us to stay alive, but for us to stay focused. If you start thinking this is the end, your response should be, then I need to focus up and get to work. I need to live my life the right way. I need to live my life focused on those who need Jesus. I need to start sharing the gospel. I need to start serving in a way that I can affect eternity. I don't just want to live here and now for this world because I think it's ending soon. So I'm going to start working for eternity instead. I'm going to start using my energy. I'm going to start using my finance. I'm going to start using my talents to take and focus on eternity and get more people there with me because the end is coming soon. For all of you, I think there's a few applications to this. One, you might be a Jesus follower, but to be honest with you, you've been asleep. You haven't been living like it's the end. You haven't been focused. You've been distracted. And maybe as you read these signs and you have that realization of thinking, I think it could happen quickly, you realize it's time to get to work. And I pray that right now God would activate you to realize you need to begin to be serious about sharing the gospel. You need to be serious about leveraging this life to change eternity instead of just focusing on the here and now. For some more of you, you're Jesus followers, but to be honest with you, when you read these stories, you start getting scared and you start making a plan of how you can stay alive. And I pray right now the peace of God would come and he would reveal to you, why would you try to hold on to a few more days in this life? The point is to get ready for eternity and that you would recognize that and the fear would begin to subside, that you don't have to craft some sort of perfect plan in light of these things. You need to step out with the gospel instead. And for some other of you, you don't know Jesus. At the beginning of this message, I said, we're going to talk about scary things, but if you know Jesus, you don't need to be scared. If you don't know Jesus, you need to be scared. That fear that you fear, that you feel that you feel, that's real and it's smart because when you read this, if you don't know Jesus, you're like, that's terrifying. It is. But you can take that step even today. That you can take that step. Jesus, the reason why he came to this earth was to pay for your sin, the sin that separated us from God and return us back to God. We don't get back to God by doing our best, by trying to be a good person. It's by accepting the free gift that Jesus brought to us and then by putting our hearts in his hands and beginning to follow him, that we do that by faith. And Jesus says, if we do that by faith, that he will rescue us and we will step from this life when the end comes or when our end comes and step on into eternal life. Would you pray with me just for a second as we finish? God, I pray for all those who are believers today. I pray that you would do work inside of their heart. If they've been asleep, I pray that you would activate them. I pray that you would wake them. I pray that you would focus them. If they've been focused on trying to stay alive, I pray you would just let them realize this. That's, there's no point to that game that you would bring comfort to their hearts instead and say, I need to just focus on what I can do for eternity instead of just trying, trying to prolong my days here. And Lord, for some who right now, they don't know you, I pray that you would bring conviction to their heart. And even right now, as you're, as you're watching this, as you're experiencing this, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond. I'm gonna count to three, and if it's you, you can raise your hand right where you are. You can throw seven in the chat if you're watching this in one of our live services. I want you to respond and take that step. If you know that you need to connect your life with Jesus right now, you take a step. Don't miss it. One, two, three. God, you see hands everywhere, Lord all over the place who are responding to this message. You see those who are responding in their heart and saying, that's what I need. I pray that right now you would rush into their lives. And as I lead them in this simple prayer that you would do work inside of their heart. I pray, do this with me. Just pray it out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my sin. Thank you for dying in my place. Please become the king of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Man, as that happens, I believe Jesus is going to rush in and do work in your heart that you have been rescued today from that sin so you can get focused and you can get to work.